All right, here we go, folks. A word from the Lord coming to you live tonight. This is the 1st of June, and we're glad that you are with us tonight. We want you to uh, have uh, our information to reach us, 276-340-2653, a from the Lord at gmail.com. How you can reach me, hope to hear from you. Um, get emails and uh, texts from individuals who are watching outside this area. Really appreciate that. Uh, glad you're watching. Glad you're getting something from the from the lesson that we're presenting. Uh, hope it's beneficial to you. And I appreciate you studying along with us. Uh, it's very encouraging. And if you're ever in the area, I hope you will stop by and visit with us. Those of you who are in the area, we meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, and we hope that you will come by and visit with us and uh, study God's Word with us. Uh, Sundays at 9 and 10 a.m. and Thursdays at 7 uh, p.m. We're glad to see you and uh, hope that you will come out and visit with us. You know, one of the things that we uh, uh, do from time to time is, or want to let you know is that we get feedback from uh, comments or those texts or emails that you send us and it lets us know really what people are thinking. And one of the ways to do that is especially comments on YouTube videos. Uh, tell us what people are thinking or, or their thought process. And it's very insightful and gives us more information to uh, help bring lessons on that will help clarify some things that maybe people are saying. And the lesson tonight is actually going to be taken from one of those comments that, that was made. And the comment that was made, I'll get to that in just a moment, but the comment that was made shows that there is a lot of Calvinism that is indoctrinated, ingrained in people's minds, and it clouds their understanding of the Bible. And re the reason why we're talking about this, friends, is because this is a very dangerous way to look at the Bible, to look through Calvin's glasses. Uh, Calvin had some had teachings and, and uh, philosophies, doctrines that really muddle the scriptures. And if you're looking through the Bible wearing uh, Calvin's glasses, then you're going to misunderstand the Bible. Now there are five basic tenets of Calvinism. Tulip, and I know that uh, uh, different ones of us have put lessons on on TV uh, concerning these five uh, steps or five statements tenets of, of Calvinism, and we're just briefly going to go through them. Total hereditary depravity, that is, this is the, uh, really you might say born in sin. This is where that comes from. You inherit a depraved nature. Total hereditary depravity. Uh, unconditional election, that means uh, <clears throat> that God has chosen individuals and there's nothing you can do ab about being the, one of the elect or one of the not elect. You just can't change that. Limited atonement, that is, atonement is only limited to those who are elect, which, which uh, uh, really does away with the blood of Christ. Irresistible grace, which means you can't uh, resist God's calling you into salvation and perseverance of saints, is once saved, always saved. And we'll get to that momentarily. You got a word from the Lord? Okay, no one's there. All right, so these five things are all connected together. And I call them Calvin's chain because... If you defeat one, it all starts falling apart. In other words, if you don't, if you don't have total hereditary depravity, if that's not if that's not true, then really the rest of them kind of fall apart. If you take one of the links out of the middle, they all fall apart. So they're all linked together, and if you and if you uh, break the chain of one, they'll all start falling. And tonight, really, what I want to focus on is the first one: total hereditary depravity, because that is where the, the comment that we're going to start with uh, comes from. Now, I say we're going to start with that. I want to show you, uh, uh, well, let's go, let me go, go ahead and uh, get to that comment. I was going to uh, go a different direction tonight, but we'll start this. Let's go ahead and just read this comment. We'll come back and read it again. Uh, here is the, here's the comments. Uh, and I say the comments that contain Calvin's contamination, because that's really what we're talking about. Here's what, here's what the man said. And I'm going to enlarge it to read some of it, uh, and we'll go through it piece by piece uh, tonight. But here's what he says. He says, that verse about children has nothing to do with whether they are born in sin or not. And he's talking about a verse that apparently was used in the lesson, in the, in the uh, video that he's commenting on. <clears throat> it wasn't on the screen. It wasn't a verse that was on my screen. So it must have been something the caller said or something. I didn't try to go back and find what actually the context was of, of saying it. 
He said, but that verse has nothing to do with whether, ch whether children are born in sin. Context is king. Children wanted to approach Jesus. Disciples were forbidding them to come closer. Jesus rebukes them. Now, he goes on to say, he goes on to say, and I'll read this again later. He says, uh, that does not automatically make you theologically right. David said, I was shapen in, the, shapen in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There is only two ways to take that. Either his mom committed adultery when he was conceived with his father, which is hogwash. He can only be talking about the sin nature being present even uh, at even conception. It is passed from parents to children. Psalm 58 also says that the wicked are estranged from the womb. Why? Because we are born in sin to believe otherwise or to say I'm not really as bad as I think I am. I pray for real Holy Spirit conviction on those filled with that kind of pride. So that's the total uh, comment that's made. We're going to look at that. But friends, this is why I'm saying the, the contamination of Calvin's doctrine is so rampant because so many people believe it. Now, I would say nearly all denominations believe this to some degree uh, 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 based upon their, their books and their catechisms. Now, they may or not all agree with all five of them to a, to a strong degree, but most of them will agree with born in sin and once saved, always saved, the first and last one. You'll find a lot of people, well, they know about this one and they know about this one. And they don't really know if they believe this or not. Or some of them do, some of them don't. But when we're talking about born in sin, total hereditary depravity, they will all say this. Here's an example. This is from the, <clears throat> this is from the Methodist discipline. And here's the quote. It says, Origin, Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, but it is the corruption of the nature of every man that naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness and his own nature inclined to evil and that continually. So your own nature is continually inclined to evil. You get that from Adam. It's, it's engendered. It's handed down. And uh, <clears throat> you just really can't do anything about it. That's the Methodist discipline. All right? Here's another one. Church of God in Christ. Here's their, here's their uh, catechism, their creed book. It says, it's under the uh, caption or the, the heading of the doctrine of sin. And this is what they say. I'm going to start reading here. Uh, it says, it began uh, it, in the angelic world and is transmitted into the blood of the human race through disobedience and deception motivated by unbelief. Adam's sin committed by eating of the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, carried with it permanent pollution or depraved human nature to all his descendants. This is called original sin. Because, one, because it was transmitted from the federal head of the human race. Two, because it is present in the life of all from birth. Three, because it motivates all actual sins. <clears throat> original sin had to have the following results. Number one, total depravity of human nature. And they give all kinds of verses here. But friends, here's the danger. If you're starting out with a false print, a precept or false belief, you're going to find all kinds of verses that will support that belief, even though it will be a chink in the armor if you can just find one verse that's contrary to that. So if I can show you one verse or explain how one verse does not support total regular depravity, then all these other verses have to be viewed in the same light. You can't say, well, okay, you explained away one verse. But what about the rest of the verses? No. If one verse will, will answer or will contradict born in sin, then all of these other verses have to be considered this in the same light. And so I'm, I'm showing you these catechisms and creeds <clears throat> because I want you to see just how far-reaching this doctrine of Calvinism is. Here's one more. This is the discipline of the Wesleyan Church. It says, We believe that humanity's creation from the image of God included ability to choose between right and wrong. Now listen. When God created Adam, he gave him the ability to choose, right, choose between right and wrong. Now listen. He says, they says, thus individuals were made morally responsible for their choices. But 
Since the fall of Adam, people are unable in their own strength to do the right. Now think about that, friends. When God created Adam, he gave us free choice. Adam could choose right or wrong. Man was responsible for his own choices. But since the fall of Adam, people are unable to do right. That is, they just can't choose to do right. This is due to original sin, which is not simply the following of Adam's example, but rather the corruption of the nature of more of, of each mortal and is reproduced naturally in Adam's descendants. Now, how did Adam get a free choice and you and I don't? Because really, that's what, that's what the Western church is saying. You don't get free choice. Adam had free choice and he chose to sin. Now, from that time on, everybody... Everybody inherits Adam's sin. Boy, if Adam would just said to Eve, no, I'm not going to eat of that fruit. If he had made just one righteous choice, just one righteous choice. You know, just think about that. If Adam made one righteous choice, he'd have passed on his righteousness. Man, Adam. See, now wait a minute. But Adam did choose to do right, didn't he? God told him to. Name all the animals. Didn't he do that? See, now why is it Adam did some right things? He did some righteous things. He obeyed God. How come we don't get to say, well, hey, Adam did right though, so we should pass on, he, we should get his righteousness passed on. See how, how, how crazy it is, friends? To say that we inherit Adam's sin because he made one choice and therefore all down the line we're just doomed. Doom and gloom because Adam took the bite of the fruit. Well, friends, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that the problem that men have is they just don't write it about the truth. Now, again, here's the quote, or here's the, uh, the comment from one of the viewers, and it shows how far ingrained this uh, Calvin's uh, doctrine really is. But we're going to show the chink in the chain. We're going to show the, the missing link or the weak link and how it all fall apart. All right, let's go again. Let's look again at his quote, the first part of the quote. He says, that verse about children has nothing to do with whether they're born in sin or not. Context is king. We're going to come back to this because that is so true. Context is the king. The children wanted to approach Jesus. The disciples were forbidding them to come closer to Jesus. He rebukes them. Now, <clears throat> the, the verse <clears throat> that is being referenced or the, the situation that's being referenced here is in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 15. And here's, let's just read the scripture here. Matthew uh, 19, 13 through 15. Then were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus uh, said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed and departed thence. Now, The viewer is right when he says this verse is not talking about born in sin. That, that, that's exactly right. It's not talking about born in sin. But friends, it does have a principle that will tell us something about being born in sin. See, that's, that's what we're talking about. People miss, they miss uh, the scriptures. They can read the scriptures and boy, they miss so much of it. They can read the scriptures and yet they miss it. They're just like birds sitting on a telegraph wire. You know? The birds don't know anything about what's going under their feet even though they're sitting right there on the wire. And here are folks that are sitting right on the Bible. They're sitting right on the Bible and they don't know anything that's going past them. They just miss it. All right? Well, let's notice this. You're right. It's not talking about born in sin. But we do know something about the nature of children from this verse. Jesus says, Forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now what does that tell us? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like the nature of these children. So yes, it's not talking, you're right, it's not talking about born in sin. But there is something we can learn about born in sin from this verse. When Jesus says, of su for of such is the kingdom of heaven, why would Jesus say the kingdom of heaven is like a bunch of children that were totally depraved because they inherited Adam's sin. See? The point 
is the nature of the children and the nature of the kingdom are the same. Now, how do we know this? Well, let's back up. If we back up to uh, one chapter, if we back up one chapter, look at chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, and let's start in verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be, born, be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, this is not talking about born in sin. I know that. I understand that. It's talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom and how Jesus says you need to humble yourself, be converted, and become his little children. But again, there is some insight to what the nature of children really is because Jesus says if you don't become like little children, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. How is it then that people miss this when they say, well, you're born in sin? If little children were born in sin, why would Jesus be saying, become like them? Well, James, that's not talking about born in sin. That's talking about uh, uh, how to enter the kingdom of heaven. Exactly right. It's talking about becoming like little children. What are little children like? According to Calvin, they're totally depraved. According to Calvin, they've inherited all this sin. According to Calvin, we have to go back, according to to Calvinism, we would have to go back and become as sinful children. Wouldn't the goal really be to not become like them or the goal to become unlike them? Why didn't Jesus say, except you be converted and not become like these depraved, uh, vile, sinful uh, uh, children? Why, why didn't he say that? Unless unless the nature of the children is not vile and sinful and depraved, unless it is sinless and safe and meek and, and innocent. Why, 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 not, why wouldn't that be the goal? See? If they were born in sin, Jesus would be saying, don't, <laughs> see this kid right here? Don't be like him. You know? Don't be like him. Don't be like this depraved kid right here. I mean, I, I don't know what the Calvinist Bi Calvin Bible uh, reads like, but, uh, you know, it may be Matthew 18 in the Calvin Bible says, except you be converted and don't become like Damien in the, in the movie The Omen, you know, or don't become like whoever that girl was and turned her head around and spit green vial everywhere. I don't know what movie that's from. Amityville Horror or something like that. I, I don't know. The Exorcist. Why didn't he say that? Don't become like these vile kids that are, that are uh, tainted with sin and corrupt and, and uh, under the power of the devil. He didn't say that. Why? Because children are innocent, friends. They're innocent. And Jesus says, you need to become more childlike. All right? Become as little children. Now, the, the, the writer says context is king. Context is king. And then he quotes Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5. David said, I was shapen in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Well, let's read that verse. Let's read that verse. Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. All right, let's make sure we can read that. Now let's go back to his, uh, uh, to his comment. He says there is only two ways to take that. Either his mom committed adultery when he was conceived with his father, which is hogwash. He can only be talking about the nature being present at even conception. It is passed from parents to children. Now, friends, when he says context is king, that's exactly right. Now, when we're talking about context, it's not only important that we read the context of the, the immediate context. All right, Immediate context are the verses immediately surrounding the verses. The verses before it and the verses after it. So, let's look at context for a minute here. In, this con in the context of Psalm 51, David is lamenting, 
All right? He's repenting of the sin that he's committed with Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet's come into him. Thou art the man. You know, you killed Uriah. You, thou art the man. David, boy, you know, David's cut to the heart. So this is the context. His sin with Bathsheba. And here's what he says. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy uh, loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. He said, wash me thoroughly from my my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this uh, uh, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Now, stop there for a moment, friends. Now, you think about what we just learned about Calvinism. Learn, think about what we just learned about all the people who are quoting Calvin and saying we born in sin have inherited this sinful nature. And stop and ask the question. Let's do a little critical thing here. Why is David asking God to forgive his sins? Why is David saying, uh, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin? Why isn't David asking him for a new nature? Why isn't David saying to God, look, I know that I've done wrong, but you know what? It's just my depraved nature. I don't have a choice. Adam had a choice. I don't have a choice. Why isn't he saying that? You see, David recognizes, David recognizes that sin is personal with him. It is his sin. It's not something that he inherited from somebody. It's not based upon his nature, depraved nature that he inherited from somebody. He recognizes what sin really is. And so if David, if David believed and thought and understood that he inherited a sinful nature, why even worry about it? I acknowledge my transgressions based upon my depraved uh, uh, nature which I inherited from Father Adam. So, hey, you know, God, you just got to overlook it because, hey, <clears throat> born in sin, once saved, always saved. What you going to do, Lord? See that? But no, David says, look, I've sinned. David is saying, I have sinned. I've done this evil in my sight. He's not blaming it on a depraved nature, but that's what all of our religious neighbors are going to blame it on. And so then when they get to verse 5, they go, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now remember, context is king. Now the immediate context does not support born in sin. You know what else doesn't, doesn't support born in sin? <clears throat> the, the, uh, uh, the context of the rest of the scripture. Right? The remote context is what it's called. That is the context of other verses. Now, let's look at the context of the other verses. The viewer said context is king, but he doesn't acknowledge it as king because he doesn't look at the context of other verses. Look, friends, if, you, if you're curious about what a phrase means, find similar phrases. Find things in the Bible and see if they make sense when you put your, uh, uh, your understanding of one verse on those. All right? In other words, you're taking a verse. This, this man says, well, David says, I was shaped in iniquity and sin and my mother conceived me. Therefore, he's born in sin. Let's just see if that makes sense in other verses. In other words, he says, David was conceived in sin, and that's because he had a nature that just called him to sin. Well, let's look at this. In Genesis 14, in Genesis 14 and verse 14, <clears throat> when Abram heard about Lot being carried, carried captive, you know, Lot's down there in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they come down and, and uh, kings of the, of the vale carried him captive, 
Abram heard that his brother was, was taken captive. He armed his trained servants born in his own house. Now, these servants were trained and they were born in his house. So my question is, now, were they born trained? Because the Bible says trained servants born in this house. Were they born trained? Boy, I tell you what. If you've got an army, if you've got, if you've got some people that are born trained, that, we, need to find, we need to find the genes of that <clears throat> and we need to, you know, we need to just, hey, we can, we, can, uh, we can supply enough troops for the whole army. Navy, Air Force, and Marines. They born trained. Born trained. Is that really what it's saying? They were trained servants born in this house. Friends, you know that these folks were born in his, in his house and they had to be trained. It was not in their nature to be trained. It was not in their nature that they just, well, hey, I, I'm, I've got this trained gene, you know, and I'm going to be born. And when I'm born, boy, I can, you know, I can be like the tribe of Benjamin. I can sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Boy, I'm, you know, I'm, no, friends, they had to be trained. Well, what about this? In Acts 2, verses 5 through 8, Acts 2, verses 5 through 8. Devout men, devout Jews in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, out of every nation under heaven, and notice what they said, when, when it was all noise about what was going on on the day of Pentecost, they heard every man speak in his own language. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? How are you born in the tongue? You mean to tell me that when they were born, they knew a language? When they were born, they knew a language? Or did they have to be taught it? If David said, I was shapen in iniquity, shapen in in sin, does that mean that he inherited some sinful nature? Or could it be something else? Do you mean to tell me that he just, he, well, Calvinism says he was shaping in iniquity and conceived in sin, therefore when he come out of the womb, boy, he's just a sinner. Sinner from birth. Is that really what it's talking about, friends? Is that really what it's talking about? A sinner from birth? We're going to get to that in just a moment. Here's the context. David is not talking about his sinful nature. He's not saying, I have a sinful nature and therefore I, I didn't have any choice to do this. He's actually talking about the circumstances and the consequences that brought him to be conceived. And he goes back, he's going back to Judah and Tamar. Now Genesis 38 Verses 13 through 20. Genesis 38, 13 through 20. Now somebody's going to say, well, we know this. We know, we've heard you say this before. Well, some people haven't. And some people have heard it before and they need to hear it again. Because obviously they're not getting it. Here's the context of this. Judah has two sons. One's named Ur and one named Onan. Ur dies. He was wicked. God killed him. The law was when a man died and didn't have any seed, then his brother would go in and be husband to the wife, the widow, sow and raise up seed to the dead brother. So Ur died without any seed. Onan was supposed to raise up seed by Tamar, have a child with Tamar, in order to keep his brother's name alive, and he didn't do it. He said, I know it's not going to be my child. I'm not going to do it. So God killed him. Well, Judah had another son whose name was Shelah, and he was too young. And so Judah says to Tamar, just wait till, he's, till Shelah's a little bit older, and I'll give you uh, uh, to be wife to him and raise up seed, and so just go back to your father's house and just wait till he gets a little older. Well, 
Let's get to, here we are in verse 13. It was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law in goeth up to Timnah to shear his sheep. And she put on her widow's garments. Now, now Judah's wife has died. All right? So he's a widower. And Tamar takes off her widow's garments and covers her uh, and covered her with the veil and wrapped herself and sat in the open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. All right? So she realizes Judah is not doing what he's supposed to do. And when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she covered her face. Uh, and he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come, to, uh, uh, come in unto thee. For he knew not that it was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? All right. So she said, What are you going to pay me? And he said, I will send one of the kids of the flock. And she says, Well, you're going to have to give me a pledge. What are you going to give me that I can hold as collateral until you give me a kid from the flock, you know, as payment for my services. And so she winds up taking his signet, his bracelet, and his staff. Verse 18. And so he gave that to her, gave her his bracelet, his ring, his staff, and, you know, they went into the tent together. He lay with her, went on his way. She up and leaves. So Judah sends... Uh, you know, he sends the payment back. Now there's no heart in this place. Didn't know where she was. You know, so Judah goes, well, all right. I don't, I don't know. Well, can't find her. Well, as, and as time goes on, verse 24 came to pass. Now I know I'm paraphrasing this, but we've got a lot of ground to cover. As, as uh, came to pass, about three months, it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. And when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet, the bracelets, and the staff. He says, Whoever these belong to, that's the daddy. And Judah said, Acknowledge them, and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because I gave her not to Sheila my son, and he knew her again no more. It came to pass, she had twins, one of them was named Ferris, and one of them was named Zerah. All right, Ferris was, uh, was, was the oldest, all right? So, here's what David is referring to. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because, notice, here is what the law said about this. In Deuteronomy 23, Deuteronomy 23 and verse 2, a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Pharez was the child, was really the illegitimate child of Judah. Sheila should have been the husband to Tamar, but Judah, Judah played the whoremonger and was, had a child by Tamar. So really it's illegitimate. Well, the law said that a bastard shall not enter the congregation for ten generations. Now, fast forward. Fast forward to the book of Ruth. Ruth 4 and verse 10. Now we have, we have Boaz going to marry Ruth. He's going to perform the same duty to Ruth that Onan and Shelah should have performed to Tamar. But he's, going to do, he's doing it what he should be doing. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance that the name of the dead be not cut off from among, <coughs> from among his uh, people. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord uh, make the woman that is coming to thine house like Rachel and Leah, which two did build the house of Israel. Now listen to what they say. Uh, and do thou worthily in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem, and let thy house, verse 12, and let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Going all the way back to Perez. 
Why? Because we're looking for ten generations. Boaz took Ruth uh, to be his wife. She conceived, bare a son. Everybody's happy because his name will come down here. Uh, verse, uh, let's just come on down here to verse 17. There's a son born, uh, born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, and he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, let's count the generations here. These are the generations of Pharez. Here's Pharez. Pharez begat Hezron. That's two. Hezron begat Ram. That's three. Ram begat Aminadab. That's four. Aminadab begat Nashon. That's five. Nashon begat Salmon. That's six. Salmon begat Boaz. That's seven. Boaz begat Obed. That's eight. Obed begat Jesse. That's nine. Jesse begat David. That's ten. Ten generations. So, David is referring to the sin that was actually plaguing his house, his family, for ten generations. All right? And really, if you think about it, Judah really committed, in a way, committed the same crime David did. He fornicated. He, he, was, he, he went into someone that he did not have a right to go into. And so here, now here's David saying, you know, I was conceived in sin. He's not saying I did this because Judah did it. Oh, I inherited it from Judah. No. He's talking about the sin, the consequences that got him there. Ten generations, he's waiting for this sin to be removed. Now guess what? Guess what? That's exactly what happened. In Psalm 20, uh, 122 verse 1, Psalm one, 122 verse 1, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why? Because for ten generations, David's family couldn't go in. But David could. Because the law said for ten generations, they, you can't enter to the, king, into the, the tabernacle, the congregation. But now we can. Here's the thing. David is talking about the sin and the circumstances of his ancestors, not his nature that was depraved. Now, here's what I find interesting. When you explain this to someone who believes born in sin, you know what they usually they do? They scoff. <laughs> that, that's so crazy. David's talking about being born in sin. He's not talking about this ten generations thing. Well, which makes more sense? David talking about sin and consequences the consequences of sin from ten generations back? Are you who are talking about inheriting sin for how many generations? You know, I counted it. I think there's 76 generations from Adam to Jesus. How many generations are there from Jesus to you and I? How many generations are we talking about? And you're saying, well, we inherited a sinful nature. Oh, yeah, that's not hard to understand. That's not far-fetched, is it? Passing down a sinful nature from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation. Yeah, that's not far-fetched. But saying that David is talking about the consequences of sin of his family from ten generations back. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's crazy talk. That's like an evolutionist going, God created the world? That's crazy. God didn't create the world? That's, that's a crazy stuff. That's crazy stuff. How the world was created was a big bang from nothing, you know, caused a spark in a primordial soup and boom, billions and billions and trillions of years later, here we are. Yeah, which makes more sense here? Context is the king, friend. Context is king. And this is what David is referring to. Now, the viewer goes on to say this. He comments, he says, Psalm 58 also says the wicked are strange from the womb. Why? Because we are born in sin. Friends, let's look at the context of this again. Psalm 58. Psalm 58. Uh, verse 2. I believe what we're looking at. The, verse 3. The wicked, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Now, if context is a king, I sure wish someone would follow it. 
The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. Friends, if you can't go astray unless you weren't astray. You can't be estranged unless you were together at some point. See that? So when someone says, well, Psalm 58 says, yeah, you're, you're born, you go astray as soon as you're born. So does, does that mean that the minute, that as long as you're in the womb, you're okay? <laughs> See, if context is king, common sense is queen. To say that David said, yeah, <clears throat> the wicked are strange in the womb. They, they're born, born astray. They go astray as soon as they're born speaking lies. Well, that has to mean that as long as that child stays in the womb, he's in good standing with God. But the minute he's born, the minute he's born, boy, he's, he's a vile, sinful creature. The minute, the minute he's born, oh, total prey, boom, all of a sudden now his nature kicks in. He starts jib-jabbing lies. Maybe that's what maybe that's what they said in Act, meant what in Acts two when they said tongues where we're born, born speaking is that no friend see how ridiculous it gets when you try to force a man made doctrine into the truth of God's word and by the way at what point in the birth process does your sinful nature kick in I mean look. It's, I mean, the verse clearly says, the verse clearly says, they go astray as soon as they be born. So, at what point are they not astray? All right? Do they go astray when the little nose comes out? Or the head comes out? Now they're astray? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I've watched both of my children be born. I'm kind of curious. At what point... Were they safe and innocent and not depraved? And at what point did they, all of a sudden, their nature just turn like that and they become depraved? When their arms came out? Halfway? What? Hips? Legs? Or that last little toe? Which one was it? See? See how ridiculous it is? But that's what they, oh, they go astray the minute they're born. Yeah. Speaking lies. Have you ever heard a baby talk? Really, friends? If context is king, com common sense is the queen. But no one seems to let them rule. Listen to this. In John 16, 21. John 16, 21. A woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she delivered the child, is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Why would she be happy? As long as that child was in her womb, he wasn't astray. As long as that child was in her womb, oh, like that with God, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're right there together. No sin, no sinful nature, long, come out of the womb, boom. Turned into a little heathen devil. Yeah. Why is she happy? See, friends, born in sin, this total ready depravity, is, is so absurd. It's so absurd, not to mention the consequences, not to mention the consequences that it brings upon innocent children. All right? Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. What sin did that baby commit? Being born? Now, I don't know about you folks, but I know that when a woman is getting ready to have a baby, you, just, you, you pretty much can't stop that. You pretty much can't stop it. You know? Sometimes doctors tell, 
tell a woman, don't push, don't push. Oh, I can't help it. Got to push. What was the sin? What was the sin? What sin does a child transgress or commit? What law does it, does it violate? The wage of sin or death, Romans 6, verse 23. Everybody knows that verse. See the consequences? Born in sin makes, makes hell full of, full of innocent babies. It makes hell full of babies. Now, friends, let me tell you. You know someone, you know someone who had, who's lost a child in infancy or at birth. <clears throat> you know someone who's lost a child, young, a young child. You tell them that their child is lost. You tell them their child's going to hell. You won't do it, even though that's what your doctrine teaches. You know, one, t- one day we were, we were knocking doors, and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, talked to a lady. She said she'd be interested in the Bible study. We went back for the Bible study, and her husband was there. He said, you told my wife that our child is going to go to hell. I said, no, sir. No, sir. Found out he was a member of the Baptist church, and I said, you know, actually... Your preacher would say your child is going to hell because your preacher says the child is born in sin. The Bible doesn't teach that. I don't teach that. I don't believe that. Now, he was just trying to be difficult. You know, she really didn't want to have a Bible study. I don't know why she said she did. But if she didn't want to have a Bible study, just say, no, I'm not interested. Okay, fine. But nonetheless, it was, it was interesting to note that they're accusing us of teaching what they actually believe. Now, friends, that's the consequences. That's the consequences of born in sin. That's the consequence. Now, remember what the uh, what our viewer wrote in his comment. He said, "To believe otherwise, in other words, if you don't believe born in sin." is to say I'm not really as bad as I think I am. Friends, I don't think that children are as bad as you think they are. That's the real, that's the real con- uh, conclusion here. To say that you're not born in sin <clears throat> is to say that children are innocent. And they get a choice. At some point in their life, they get a choice to choose whether they're going to serve God or not. To say that they're born in sin is really to say that children are worse than they they really are. And by the way, what is this inherited sin? You know, where is it? Maybe, you know, we've we've come a long way. Science has come a long way in medical research and DNA and stuff. Maybe, what chromosome is that on? What chromosome is that inherited, depraved gene on? Can, Can we just... Get rid of that thing? Maybe science can figure it out because apparently, apparently, the blood of Christ can't. What do you mean, James? Apparently the blood of Christ can't get rid of it. Maybe science can figure it out. Maybe science can go in there into DNA and, and get rid of it. Because folks who say you're born in sin because you've inherited Adam's sinful nature really say that the blood of Christ cannot cleanse from sin. That's really what they're saying. See? That, that's really what they're saying. Uh, let's look. Uh, In Matthew, tw- Matthew 1, verse 21. Matthew 1, verse 21. The Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and I shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sin. But not Adam's depraved nature. Jesus can forgive your sins, but that sinful nature, <laughs> no, it's on there like the stain, like the talking stain. You know, it's stuck on there. It's on there like stain on a white shirt. You ain't getting that out. 
The blood of Christ, he can cleanse you from your sins, but your sinful nature, man, he just can't do it. Friends, don't you think that if God knew that the minute Adam sinned, he was going to give all descendants a sinful nature, that he would have made the blood of Christ cover up that and change their sinful nature? That he could change their, change their sinful nature where it's not inherited? You think God didn't see that coming? I mean, if it's true, why didn't God see it coming? Oh, yeah, they inherited Adam's sin. God didn't realize that. He'd already, he'd already sent his son to die for the sin of the world, and then he realized, you know what, 2,000 years ago Adam sinned, and now we're inherited the sinful nature. And I should have corrected that a long time ago. Well, oh, well, too bad. I mean, surely, surely, at least when Christ died on the cross, sinful nature would be gone. I get the blood of bulls and goats couldn't forgive sins. It surely couldn't change the sinful nature, but man, you would think that the blood of Christ, if it can take away sins, and that's exactly what it does. Hebrews 8, verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Surely the blood of Christ could take away that sinful nature and keep it from being passed on to generation to generation to generation. But no. No, Adam sin, boys. It's tough. It's ground in like it's ground in like yard dirt on a white carpet. You ain't getting that out. Acts three verse nineteen. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, but not Adam's sinful nature. You're gonna pass that on down. You got children? Boom. They're gonna come out lying to you. They're going to come out lying. 1 John 2, verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. But not Adam's sinful nature. No. <laughs> Can't get rid of that. You stuck with it. You stuck with it. Adam's sinful nature, yeah, it's on you like, it's on you like the mark of Cain. Yep, you just can't get rid of that thing. Yep, you branded. Sure enough. See how ridiculous it is, friends? When you read the Bible and you read what God says about sins being blotted out, removed, forgiven, forgotten, taken away, remembered no more, and then on the other hand you've got this false doctrine of born in sin, inherited depravity that you just can't get rid of. You just made the curse stronger than the cure. You made the sinful nature more powerful than salvation. You got the blot and blemish of sin more powerful than the blood of the Savior. I don't believe that, friends. The Bible doesn't teach it. I'm not going to believe it. The Bible doesn't teach it. You shouldn't believe it either. But individuals who keep looking through the, uh, at the Bible with Calvin's contacts on, right? Calvin's corrupted contacts and all they're seeing is, is uh, total heredity depravity. You're going to miss a whole lot of the Bible. You're going to miss a whole lot of the Bible. And you're going to miss heaven. You're going to miss heaven because this is a false doctrine. This doctrine is not in the Bible. God said, whosoever adds to my word... I'll add them to you in the plagues of life. Friends, you're, you're adding to God's word when you say it teaches something it doesn't. Friends, I'm out of time. I'm, I'm finna wrap up here. I hope this has helped. I hope you see the folly of Calvinism. Maybe next week I've got another uh, <clears throat> comment from someone that talks about another part of that uh, chain. We may talk about that next week. We'll just have to see how it goes. But friends, I hope it's helped. And I hope it's been beneficial. I hope it helps you to see. And hope, I hope that it helps you in talking with your neighbor or your co-worker who believes in born in sin. I hope it helps you uh, show them, no, that's contrary to the Bible. Friends, thanks for your attention. Thanks for watching. Always make sure that you're getting a word from the Lord.
Till next time, have a good night.